Well, good morning, Well Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Okay, some of the youth are doing all right. Well, I, if you don't know, my name is Jake Schmidley, and I'm the youth pastor here at the Well Church Marshfield, and uh, our head pastor, Dylan, and his wife, Maddie, are on a well-needed, much-deserved vacation, and so he asked me to come up here and give a word. Man, I get to pour into our students every single Wednesday night, and if you don't know, God has been moving in our youth group, and and we've been seeing incredible things. Uh, We get to go to camp next week. Where's all my youth at? We get to go to youth camp next week, so I'm super pumped and excited about that, but man, life for me has is, is been uh, a challenge, you know? And even this last year, things have been different. There's been a bunch of new things that have happened to me in my life. I got married and uh, we have a baby on the way. I found out last Sunday we're having a boy, so I'm super pumped and excited about that. But uh, man, you know, marriage can be a challenge sometimes. All the husbands and wives say amen, right? Uh, I'm still learning. And um, the other day we were at the house and we were, uh, we had a double date planned with some of our friends and uh, my wife is pregnant and she's just a sleepy bear. I mean, she, I don't know if this is just the phase that she's in or what, but she just sleeps all the time. I literally think she's awake maybe like four or five hours out of the entire day. And so she's laying there sleeping on the couch and I'm faced with the decision like, do I wake her up? Right, husbands, you know what happens when you wake your wife up from the nap. Uh, uh, But we've only got 30 minutes to get ready, so you know how that is too. You know, they take their time. So I'm treading lightly, but it's 30 minutes, so I wake her up. Hey, we gotta gotta get ready, we gotta go. And so she's like, okay. And I go into the room and I throw something on real quick and I can't find my belt. And I look over at her and she's sitting on the edge of the bed and she's kind of upset and I ignore that, and I'm like, hey, do you know where my belt's at? And uh, she's like, no, I don't know where your belt's at. And so I leave, and I go and look for my belt, and I can't find it. And so I go back into the room, and she's sitting in the same exact spot, uh, visibly more upset. And I'm like, hey, you seriously don't know where my belt's at? And she's like, no, I don't know where your belt's at. I'm like, okay. So I leave, and I'm looking for it up and down, and finally I find it in the exact place that I left it, wives, you know what I'm talking about? And uh, so I'm like, oh gosh, I'm, I'm an idiot. So I go back into the room and I find her there in the same spot and this time tears are streaming down her face and I'm like, oh no. And so I, I'm like, hey, what's wrong? And she's like, I'm, I'm pregnant, I can't fit into any of my clothes anymore. And uh, me with all of my wisdom and godly knowledge that I have, I, I look at her and I say, well, what do you think is gonna happen when you get pregnant, you know? Uh, I, like I said, husbands, I'm still learning. That definitely wasn't the right response at that moment. But I tell you that story because the issue there was that I was so focused and I was so preoccupied with my own condition and my own problem that I didn't actually take time to help her. I didn't actually take time to console her, to, to try to help her and figure out what was actually going wrong with her because I, I, was, I was tunnel vision. I was locked in on my own problem. I was locked in on my own struggle and I wasn't worried about what she was going through. If you've got notes in this place, The title of my sermon today is called Tunnel Vision. Look at the neighbor on your right and say, Tunnel Vision. Look at the neighbor on your left and say, Do you have tunnel vision? The scripture that I'm going to be in today is in Mark chapter 12, verses 31. And these are the words of Jesus, so this has got to be important to us. It says, The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. No other command is greater than these. When I read this scripture, the first thing that I think of and I ask myself is, how much do I really love myself? You know, I think that if we're not careful, we can start to think, well, like, I, I care about other people, and, and I love other people, and, and, but, like, let's go underneath the, the surface a little bit this morning, like, I make sure that I've got clothes 
and nice clothes, or at least I think so. Uh, I make sure that I've got food in the pantry. I make sure that I've got a nice house and the decks power wash before the people come over. I, I make sure, right, because I love myself and I love my, my stuff. And, and, and if I'm not careful and if we're not careful, we can get caught up in this, this trap of always wanting to have the newest, the nicest because we love ourselves because we care about ourselves so much. And, and, and I, I, I ask myself, what if we actually cared about other people the same way that we actually care about ourselves? I mean, think about it. Like we, we say that we do, and I'm sure for a moment in time that's genuine, but like when there's something going on with your kids and your family, are you not right there to help and provide and do whatever it is that you've got to do? But what about other people? See, when he says love your neighbor, he's not necessarily talking about just your Family. He's talking about your friends and your peers and your coworkers and the people around you. What would life look like? What would your life look like if you actually cared and loved your neighbor the same way that you care and love about yourself? I think this morning that God is trying to break our hearts once again for the same things that breaks his because you know it breaks his heart to see people going without, to see people all alone and isolated and not have support and not have people to come alongside of them in their life. The definition of tunnel vision is this, to be distracted from an immediate or an important issue. And I think if we're all being honest in this place, we can get so distracted with our own lives, just like I was with my belt, right? Our own lives and our own problems and our own struggles and our own family and our own whatever, that we fail to look past that. And we fail to see the people in need that truly need our help. See, we are called to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. We're called to help people, to, to pour into people, to help people who don't have enough. That's what we as the church are called to do. That was the reason that, that Christ came. He came with the tax collectors and the drunks because he came to help those who were in need. And I think today, like, if, if we just need a little reminder that we're so caught up with our own lives. We're so caught up with our own problems and our own struggles and our own things that we've got going on that we fail to look past ourselves and our struggles to other people who need it and need help. We don't think of others as higher than ourselves. Our humility, more often than not, it's, Man, if, if he would have picked me to do that, I would have done that better than he did. I would have been better than she did. I don't know why they gave her the promotion because I deserve it and I would have been better. And all of a sudden, this pride starts to come out because we're selfish, church. <clears throat> I think one thing that's important that we all have to remember today is, is that your actions, my actions, they don't just affect you. They affect your relationships and your family and the people that are closest to you and the people that are around you. We're so consumed with our own problems and our own anxiety. We keep looking internally at our own things that, that we're missing people walking by every single day that need to hear the gospel message. But, but we're so full of fear. And we're so full of depression, and we don't have enough of this, and we don't have enough of that. And there's people that are walking by us every single day that need the message of hope that you and I have to offer. I think that if we could take our eyes off of ourselves and our own problems, and we could start loving other people the way that Jesus would, I think we would experience some freedom in those areas we struggle, amen? Amen. Yeah, we fail to recognize that the choices we make don't just affect ourselves. I, when I was 20 years old, which was ages ago, uh, my younger sister, Josie, she had a birthday party. And at this time in my life, I was, I was head over heels into my addiction, drinking and partying and uh, you name it. 
and I was doing it. And um, you can ask any of my family, there was years that went by that I, I honestly didn't see my family. They would call me and say, hey, we've got Thanksgiving this day or Christmas this day. Will you be there? And I'd be like, yeah, I'll be there. And then I wouldn't show up. And that was who I was known for. Um, and my mom calls me and she says, Jake, Josie's birthday party's coming up. She told me to call you because she really wants you there. She hasn't seen you for two years and she really wants you to be there. And I'm like, okay, yeah, mom, I'll be there. And uh, she, she kind of backtracked a little bit and she was like, Jake, you know when moms get, get the real serious voice and, and it's like, okay, I gotta listen to this. Jake, you've gotta be there. So, okay, I set a reminder in my calendar because I'm the busiest guy on the face of the earth and I've got a thousand meetings and appointments and things like that going on. But I, I get this reminder and it's, it's the day of her birthday and I'm getting ready. And I'm in the bathroom, I'm trying to look presentable because when I was in my addiction, like my teeth were falling out of my head, my beard was all scraggly, my hair was super long. So I was just trying to clean up a little bit and look presentable. And all of a sudden I get a phone call from a buddy and, he, and I'm like, hello? He said, hey, we're going to the lake today. This person's coming and this girl's coming and we're going to drink and we're gonna do this and we're gonna have fun, we're gonna hang out. Do you wanna come? And unfortunately, without hesitation, I was like, yes, I wanna go. And just as quickly as I was getting ready for my sister's birthday party, I went and put on some swimming trunks and headed out the door. The next day, my mom starts calling me and my heart starts beating, right? Because you know mom's mad. And rightfully so, she ripped me up and down on that conversation that we had. But she said something that I will never, ever forget. And she said, Jake, what you don't realize is that your choices and your decisions don't just affect yourself. The choices that you make, they don't just affect other people. And she was like, your sister was crying yesterday, couldn't even enjoy her birthday party because you decided not to show up. And, and, and I think that if we're being real and honest today here at church this morning, that we're kind of the same way, that we're so caught up with our own choices and our own decisions and our own struggles that we're failing to save people. We're failing to reach out and to pull people from the fire of hell because that's where they're headed. And our job as the church is to be the hands and the feet of Jesus and to lead other people to the Lord, but we can't do that when we're so preoccupied with our own conditions. We can't do that when we're so preoccupied with our own little lives that we've got going on. Our hearts are hard, like truly. Our hearts are calloused to other people outside of our family. Because I, I can hear right now some of you saying, well, I care about my kids, and I care about my family, and I care about my husband, and I get all of that. I'm talking about the other people. I'm talking about the people who are your coworkers, your friends, the, the people in need. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Our hearts are callous this morning. The focus of my message is just that. Our hearts are so calloused that we've lost compassion for other people. Like truly, think about that. We don't care about the panhandlers anymore. I see the same dude on Glenstone and Kearney every single week that I drive by and he's got a different sign and new shoes and I've read all the articles. I know that he's got a stack of cash and he's probably got a Tesla and he's living in an apartment. He's probably fine. So you don't give them anything because of your own preconceived idea of, of who this person is, even though Jesus literally said, if you have, give. He didn't say, if you have, give, only if you know that they're gonna take the money that you give them and use it for something that's productive. He said, if you have, give. But we're just so numb to that stuff. We're so callous to that stuff. 
because we see it all the time. And, and, and we forget that those are actually the people that Jesus came to save. He's not sitting around hanging out with all the rich businessmen, all the people who got money. He's hanging out with the broke and the poor and, and the people who are afflicted and addicted, the people that need him. And that's our job. But we're so numb to those things. We don't care. We don't feel bad for people in addiction. Even though you know nothing about addiction and you don't realize that people who are addicted are completely overcome and consumed by this drug that literally takes over every thought that they have and they manipulate people because they're consumed by this drug and they do whatever it is that they need to do to get whatever it is that they want. You see people that shooting up drugs that are crying and saying, I don't want to do this but we have no compassion for those people. Because did you see who she brought her kids around? We wanna throw the book at them. Yeah, they deserve to go to prison. Her kids deserve to be taken from her. I'm just being real this morning. It's how we think, like it's just, but where's our heart and where's our compassion for those people? Where's our heart and our compassion for those people that aren't in our circles, that aren't in our friend groups, that don't go to the Bible studies? Like, where is it? That's what, that's, those are the people that Jesus came to save. Those are the people that Jesus came to rescue. He wouldn't be in here on Sunday morning, church. He'd be out in the streets trying to help people. But we're just so numb. Because it's like every week we turn on the news and there's another school shooting. And we're like, oh my gosh. And we'll make a little post and pray for this. And like, you don't even think about it the next week. Like, I'm sure you feel bad in that moment, but there's nothing ongoing that actually breaks your heart the same way that it breaks his heart. You see a war going on halfway across the world live in real time because we've got social media and the internet and all this other stuff and last month it broke your heart but what about this month? We're numb, we're calloused, our hearts are hard because the things that were unordinary are now completely normal in our society. <laughs> The things that were unordinary that we never used to see, we see all the time and it's just so normalized. And we become casual Christians. I'm trying to break through that heart of stone this morning. If you got your Bibles, the text that I'm gonna be reading out of is in the book of James, chapter one, verses 27. I'm in the NLT. I want to give you a little bit of context behind this scripture. This letter was written by James, who was Jesus' brother. I can only imagine what life was like growing up with Jesus as your brother. But James became the leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem. If you read the book of Acts in the beginning, it talks about Stephen who was martyred. He was stoned to death and he died because of his professed faith in Jesus Christ. And when that happened, all the Christians that were in the area disappeared. They all went into hiding. They all fled because they were scared that they were going to receive that exact same type of persecution. And so James becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem and he starts writing this letter to all the Christians that are in hiding, to all the Christians that are scared. And this is what he says. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for the orphans and the widows and their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. He's like, look, I get it. You're afraid for your life. I understand that you're scared of what's gonna happen to your family. I get that you're afraid of what's gonna happen to your kids, but that does not give you an excuse to not be a Christian. 
That does not give you an excuse to not care for the helpless, to not care for those who are in need. I think there's a lot of us in this place that are so in our comfort zones, that we're so scared to talk to other people about Jesus Christ. We're so scared to be the ones, to, to, to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. And I got news for you this morning. Just because you're afraid does not give you an excuse not to care for helpless people. Just because you're afraid doesn't give you an excuse. We're all called. See, the widows and the orphans, they were were the most helpless members of ancient society. They, They relied on their husbands for everything. They were their financial support because women couldn't have jobs back then. They were their social support because women weren't looked at as equal as they are now back then. And so they had to have their husbands. And if their husband was to pass away, it was like all of a sudden life was over. And it was the church's job to go and to care for them, to help them, to come alongside of them, to support them. It's our job, church. It's our job to care for other people. It's our job to care for the helpless. It's our job to care for the broken, the addicted, the afflicted, the bruised, the defeated, the depressed, the anxious. It's our job as Christians to come alongside of them. But we are comfy in our own house. We got 10 grand in the savings account and our kids got the new iPhone and everything's fine. (laughs) The helpless, the helpless need us. In the beginning of this verse, it says, he's, he's writing to these Christians, he says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father. And the reason that he says that is very specific because the Jewish people of that time they thought that the only the way that they became right with God was if they attended all the celebrations, the Passovers and the feasts, and, 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 and they made their sacrifice and they honored their Sabbath. And, and uh, that's how they thought that they were right in the sight of God. That's what they thought religion was. And James hits that on the head and he's like, no, 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 no pure and genuine religion in the sight of God. It's not all the traditions. It's caring for the helpless people. And here's how that correlates today. We have, forgive me, we have a bunch of people who have come to church longer than I have been alive, that go to church on Sunday morning, that send their kids to youth on Wednesday, that pay their tithes, and this week was a little different, they even did it online, and they think that they are right in the sight of God because they're keeping up with all the traditions, and I've got news for you today, it's not about traditions, that's not pure and genuine religion, pure and genuine undefiled religion is reaching your hand out, caring for the people who need it, the helpless people, the widows, the orphans, the broken, and the hurting. That's pure religion. It's not about all the the traditions in the church. It's not about just coming to the services and Do you remember what Jesus said to the Christian people? Many, many will say on that day, "Did did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not pay my tithes? Did I not come to church on Sunday morning? And the scariest words that we could ever hear, he'll look at them and say, depart from me because I never knew you. Church, we've got to get our hearts right again because we are failing to care for those people who need it. Our hearts are stoned and calloused All these things that we see going on in the world are so normal to us now. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God is caring for helpless people. 
And right here at the end, he says, and refusing to let the world corrupt you. You know why I think <clears throat> we're not caring for people like we should? I think that the world has corrupted us. The Bible says that we have an adversary who's crafty and cunning. He's ancient. He's been around since before you and I have been around. He knows all the tricks to get you to slip. He knows it. We come home and we put our kids to bed. And we sit up and watch our show with our wife and we don't realize that our kids in the next room with their iPhone open looking at something they know that they shouldn't be looking at. And if you're not careful, if you're not standing guard at the forefront of your home, then the enemy will slowly creep his way in. And it's the same way with the church today. The big church, the world has corrupted us with distractions of our own lives, distractions of our own problems, distractions of our own circumstances that we're so, we, we're not thinking about the people who are in need. Worship team, you can come up. We have no compassion or limited. When something happens, we care for a week or a couple weeks or a month, and then it's old news. It's last week's news. The spies correction. Don't like somebody sitting up here telling you this stuff, stepping on your toes. Because we think we already know it all. I've been to more church services, more years than you've been alive. Sometimes I think as we get older, it's not learning new things, but remembering the things that we've already forgot. So here's my refocus. Our hearts are so calloused. We have a lack of compassion for other people. Ourselves, our families, like they get it, but the others don't. This last week, I had to do a uh, funeral, and uh, their children come to the youth group, and their dad is gone. And as I was meeting with the family and and Preparing what it was I was going to say, I was reminded when my mom passed away, all the things. You get calls and texts from people you haven't talked to in nine years, and they're like, hey, man, I'm praying for you if you ever need anything. It's like genuine concern for a day or two, but you're just glad that it didn't happen to you. your kids, if it was your nieces, if it was your nephews, if it was your family, how would you act? <laughs> how would you respond? Because I, I believe if we're all being honest in this place, we would care just a little bit more. How do you love like Jesus? You love them as you love yourself. You care about other people the same way that you care about yourself. I don't know where we've gone wrong. I don't know where we've lost it. I'm not sure, but what I do know is that we have to come back to that. We have to come back to that. I believe there's people in this place this morning Everybody stand up with me. <clears throat> I believe there's people in this place this morning that have been going to church for a very long time. And their 
realizing like, I've been caught up in, in the tradition. <laughs> I've been caught up in the Sunday morning, Wednesday routine, but I'm not, I don't actually have a heart for other people. I'm not actually caring about other people the same way that I care about myself. There's people in this place this morning that are trying to protect and maintain this image that they've put up and it's all fake and it's not real. And there's some of you in this place this morning you'd give your kids. They don't get the same they don't get the same care that you would give your family. Oh, I have to remind you that we are called to love our neighbor the same way that we love ourselves. And if you don't know how much you love yourself, ask him. Search me, oh God. Show me my faults. Show me because he will give it to you. He said, if you need wisdom, just ask, and I will give it to you. Oh, but we're so distracted. We're so distracted. We're not getting a long time with God. We're not getting our, in our word. We're not getting in our prayer. And we're distracted with our own cares and our own. morning because he wants to but he's a gentleman and he's not going to barge his way into your heart he's not going to barge his way into your life he wants you to ask him give him permission this morning and access to the deepest depths of who you are because that's what he wants all of you not just half of you not just some of you not just you on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights he wants it all oh. 